welcome, 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 welcome. I, uh, I'm, I'm pretty excited. Uh, I hope you are excited as well. I'm excited on this journey that we may go uh, on together. Uh, f a few reasons. Maybe we can sparkle some seeds uh, throughout the world um, of some healing, some uh, awakening awareness, um, and to start to, in our own lives, see if we can take what we, what, what, we, what we call this vessel of awareness, what we feel as if we can hold, um, and start to expand it and start to uh, expand it to the capacity to drop the vessel entirely, that there is no vessel, but to really feel that and to be able to hold it all, that we can hold all of existence, all of the present moment, whatever is occurring for us in that moment and see what emerges in the presence when there is no resistance, when there is no fight, when there is no battle of even the mind or the senses of the present moment. So this is the beginning. And uh, I'm really excited because by being able to do this, I not only uh, continue to do my own practice, um, but it is uh, a challenge for me to create a path that seems to be most authentic for which in a way, we have sort of set the groundwork for it over the last few years, uh, doing work with ESF, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The goal of today's session is really to meet the foundation of any work that one wants to do with the body, any work that one wants to do uh, with spirituality, any work that one wants to do with really getting in tune with your thoughts, your emotions, your sensations that are arising, to really get in tune with possible past events, as well as being able to fully hold and witness and be present for anything that may happen in the future, that you start to become uh, more resilient. And in that, in, in, in that case, then uh, that you trust the natural unfolding of life as it occurs in every moment. And that you may say to yourself, oh, you know, I was able to handle that. And now I can handle this, and now I can handle this, and now I can handle this, and now I can handle this. And in a way, these first few sessions that we are going to do are a way of starting to tap into our nervous system and support the optimal functioning of our nervous system so that we can actually hold the present moment, whatever arises with openness and curiosity, without resistance, with full acceptance, with no tension, without, not, without wanting to change it or being different than what it is. If you just ask yourself, how many times today have I been not okay with the present moment? How many times today have I resisted what is happening? It's happening. Here it is. It's happening. 
and yet I'm resisting it. There's a reality that is emerging, and yet I am. Uh, there's a resistance felt inside. I'm not okay. There's not an acceptance. How many times today have you done that? What were those events? Why? What made you do that? What if each one of those events you could fully accept that you could fully have absolutely no resistance to? And a lot of that, believe it or not, in my opinion, comes from learning how to have a more resilient nervous system. So that what many people have described that we have <clears throat> what we call a zone, sort of a zone of tolerance. And I'll share a slide uh, that, I, that, that I picked up from uh, a psychologist, Sarah Ross, who does a lot of work in uh, somatic experiencing with Peter Levine. Um, Peter Levine uh, has written many books. Uh, one of them is, uh, is, is, uh, is uh, I believe it's called Healing the Tiger um, on somatic experiencing and healing trauma. <clears throat> so I'm just gonna share my screen for a second. I find of course not. All right. So if you see this screen, what we see here is she calls it here the window of presence. Some people call it the window of tolerance. But that there are these windows with which we feel comfortable interacting with life in. That there is a dynamic balance here between what you see here at the bottom called the parasympathetic nervous system and what you see here at the top being the sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system, you're going to hear these. Um, names a lot because we talk a lot about the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system, especially with regulating the nervous system, especially when we talk about breath work and uh, heart rate variability. The sympathetic nervous system is what most of us call the fight or flight response. It's the nervous system that uh, allows us to uh, respond quickly to let's say uh, something that's coming at us, like let's say a tiger that's coming out of the jungle and is attacking us. We need to know whether or not to run or fight the tiger. Uh, but it also helps us get up in the morning and be proactive and go out into the world. The parasympathetic nervous system is the nervous system that some people call the rest and digest nervous system or the rest and repair. And there is a dynamic balance between these nervous system that need to occur. We need to be able to fall asleep and in so doing so activating the parasympathetic nervous system so that we can fall asleep. We need to be able to get up and get dressed and take a shower which is a bit of the activation of the sympathetic nervous system. We need to be able to maybe go to work or prepare our meals, which is also the sympathetic nervous system. But then as we're eating our meals and digesting our food, we need to then be able to activate the parasympathetic nervous system to digest our food, to open up the pathways in our digestive system so that the food can be absorbed, so that we don't have cramping and bloating and indigestion because our digestive system is not working. And so what there is in a healthy human is there is a very nice dynamic balance between the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system here that you see in green 
almost like a sine wave that as you need one, it comes on board and they're in this dynamic balance with each other. And so there is resiliency. It's not that you are all in one or all in the other, but that there is actually resiliency in the nervous system. Okay, and this resiliency is healthy. This is what we want. The majority of us, however, living in a sympathetically driven world, feeling as if we are always being attacked, feeling as if we are always beaten, being threatened by whatever it might be, whether it's our job, whether it's our minds and our thoughts, whether it's our family, whether it's the current state of the pandemic, et cetera, et cetera, that we constantly are feeling as if we're getting attacked, we're constantly feeling as if we're threatened, and therefore we are predominantly in a sympathetically driven state. And that is one of, as she shows here, hyperarousal, anxiety, panic, hyperactivity, restlessness, hypervigilance, emotional flooding, chronic pain, and sleeplessness, right? Insomnia, you can't fall asleep. You're constantly worrying. There's always a threat that we're trying to come back, right? On the other side of that, there is people who are hypo aroused, who uh, have gone into a, a, a dissociative state, who let's say something has happened to them and uh, they don't feel their body. They don't want to feel their body. They are frozen. And this would be sort of an over parasympathetically driven state. And this would be hype, the opposite of hyper arousal, which would be hypo arousal. And this is more of the chronic fatigue. You feel disoriented. There's a disconnection. You may actually feel depressed. There's a freeze. You feel as if you're not really engaging or participating in society. You're not really engaging or participating emotionally uh, with others, et cetera, et cetera. What happens traditionally is that we have these spikes. We go uh, from a overly driven sympathetic state to an overly driven parasympathetic state, overly driven sympathetic state. And we are constantly out of this window of tolerance and so we're either hyper hyper aroused or hypo aroused. And you can think of this as maybe your own life or people that you know in terms of what are the drugs and medications or food that we ingest that helps us with these states. In that we wake up in the morning and we don't we don't get much rest from the night because we're not sleeping well. And so therefore we need to take caffeine or some of us take amphetamines or whatnot to help us activate that sympathetic nervous system. Then we get hyper aroused from the caffeine and we get jittery and we might actually get restless, right? And then we go to work or we interact in the day and then we come home and what do we need? We need medications that help us fall asleep we drink alcohol, and these are all ways of taking that nervous system and depressing it, bringing it down, falling asleep, getting help with medication so that you can fall asleep, and then repeating that the next day. And very, very, very few of us are in this, what we call window of tolerance or window of presence, right? What, Some of these techniques will help us do is understand our own window. We each have a window that we feel as if we can function in at this time, that we feel comfortable functioning in. By doing the techniques, some of the early techniques in this program, what hopefully you're going to start to see is that this window of tolerance starts to expand. That you're actually able to hold more, 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 and that you don't trigger a hyper aroused state or 
trigger a hypo aroused state that you might need less medications or caffeine or stimulants to get you up in the morning. And you might need less tranquilizers and alcohol and medications that help you fall asleep at night. That events might happen where you feel as if you may have actually lost your, your lid or blown your top or whatever you want to call it, but yet you're actually able to tolerate it. And it's certain techniques that you can consciously do that will help us start to expand this window of tolerance. One of the things that I want to talk to you about today is a technique that's called resourcing. Now, this is the, to me, this is like the most basic technique that we each have to master in order to progress in our own awakening, in our own expansion of awareness, and in our own healing, or whatever that might be. Okay. And so I went to, uh, you know, to the Webster dictionary to look up what the, what the, what the definition of a resource is. Um, a resource is a stock or supply of money, materials, staff, and other assets that can be drawn on by a person or organization in order to function effectively. A stock or supply of money, materials, staff, or other assets that can be drawn on by a person or, or organization or in order to function effectively. Another definition, an action or strategy which may be adopted in adverse circumstances. All right. So the practice for today, and if it doesn't happen today, tomorrow, and if it doesn't happen tomorrow, the next day, or the next day, for the rest of your life until you find a resource that works for you is to find your own resource. How great would it be to have an asset that you can draw on that helps you function effectively? <laughs> Do you have one? Do you have a resource? If you do, excellent. In this practice, we'll take you to your resource, whatever that might be. And I'll have some options for some resources you can try out. And you can practice going to that resource. If you don't have a resource, you're like, oh, I don't even, don't even know what that is. Never really thought of it. I'm not sure. Do I? What would be my resource? then this is the time to find it for yourself because everything in my opinion stems from finding your resource and being able to use your resource being able to go back to your resource at any time you want during your day during your meditation to what just like the definition say to function effectively to be adopted in adverse circumstances because if you're actually in a meditation and you are doing some activation or you are noticing a body sensation that you might be unfamiliar with, but you wish to investigate or you're uncomfortable with, our practice is going to be a titration practice of going to that uncomfortable sensation, but coming from your resource. We're not gonna do that today, we're going to try to find a resource today for you. Now, can your resource change? Absolutely. Depending on where you are in your spiritual practice, depending on where you are in your meditation practice, depending on where you are embodied or not, your resource may change over time. My resource has changed tremendously over time especially because I was such a mental person. And so initially, it was very difficult for me to find a resource in my body. Very difficult. 
didn't really even know what that meant. And so my resource became was an external object. I could do very good uh, guided imagery so I could imagine myself being uh, like at a beach. Okay. The point of a resource is finding some place that you can place your attention that you feel safe in. You go, oh, I feel safe here. And what do I mean by that, right? So I'm, I'm holding up this pen, okay? Place your attention on this pen. You got, you all did something. You all went, you, okay? There, you can place, now place your attention on your feet. You did something. Now place your attention on this pen again. Whatever you did to shift where you are placing your attention, that's exactly what I'm going to ask you to do to place your attention on a resource for you. Whatever that resource may be. So what are some examples of resources that you can use? You can use your breath. The breath is a great resource. Some people don't feel comfortable paying attention to their breath. Maybe they have a history of asthma or they were, let's say, intubated or something like that. And every time they pay attention to the breath, they get anxious or have panic attacks. Then that's not a good place. It's not a place that you can place your attention to feel safe, right? It may be a part of your body. It may be, for instance, the expansion and contraction of your lungs as you are breathing or feeling your feet on the floor or your thighs against the chair that you're sitting on. Or if you're lying down, feeling your heels against whatever surface, couch, bed that you're on. It may be that maybe the only place that you feel safe putting your attention on is your left pinky. I don't, not really comfortable in my body for whatever reason. Is there a place in your body that you do feel safe placing your attention? To find that, it's almost like an inquiry. If it's not in your body, if you can't find a place in your body, you can use something like mantra, like a repetition of a word, sound, phrase, musical note, whatever it is, that is authentic to you, that you repeat, that you can place your attention on, that you can repeat over and over with, that you feel safe with. My mantra has shifted over the years. Now my mantra, because I'm so sort of mental, love and health, love and health, love and health, love and health. If you're dealing with pain, chronic pain, for instance, it can be very difficult to place your attention in your body because when you place your attention in your body, you feel the pain. It's almost like the pain comes up. So using something that's not, let's say, a physical sensation in the body may work better for you, such as a mantra, such as imagining, for instance, bringing up in your mind's eye somebody who loves you or who you love, a family member, a friend, a partner, a child. It could even be an animal a horse that you own. It could be a plant. You know, I feel pretty safe putting my attention on that plant over there. Okay, that's it. Maybe it's a sound. You feel comfortable. You feel very safe with the sounds around you. Maybe it's you actually play music and you feel safe in listening to the music. Maybe it's a spiritual figure. 
Maybe it's the sensation of love or of community or of connection that you have with others. Okay, as you can see, it doesn't really matter what the resource is, just that you a have one and if you don't go through a list of various possible resources where you feel as if you can place your attention and you feel safe where you can relax your shoulders okay the reason this is important is because the mind has a tendency towards going towards threat. That's just how we're programmed evolutionarily. So if we know the programming, it's sort of like, oh, thank you very much. That's software version 1.0. We're going on to software version infinity because we are the masters of that software. We're gonna constantly be updating the software. Thank you very much for that software. How does that work? Well, it works based on repetition. What are the repetitive signals you're getting? Well, the repetitive signals you keep on getting are threat, 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 threat. <laughs> so my repetitive signals that I constantly are sending to my brain are survival, 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 survival. All right. And there's a beautiful adage in neuroscience that you'll hear me say over and over again, uh, repeated states become enduring traits, All right? So what state are you bringing in? Are you constantly bringing in that trait, that state of survival? Because if that's the state that you're consciously in and bringing in and allowing the default pathway to take over then that's going to be your enduring trait that's it that's who you are oh i'm constantly worrying i'm constantly surviving why because that's what you're thinking about all the time that's the repeated state that keeps on coming up and up and up and up and up and up and we are just these neurons, like a quantum mechanics machinery, super quantum computer. By bringing in this resource, then you're saying to yourself, oh, I understand that I'm constantly going towards survival. I understand that I'm constantly, that that's how I've been programmed, that evolutionarily, but now I don't have to go hunt for food or gather. What am I trying to survive from? Okay, I'm trying now. Now I'm trying to survive from COVID. Let's say. <laughs> okay. Oh, what do I need to do there? Okay, I do this. All right. Well, then I I, I take care of that. All right. What else? Well, uh, every time I get in the car, I I feel like I'm being threatened by others. They're coming close to me and stuff like that. Oh, okay. So you get in a car, you're sitting in a car and you feel like you're threatened. And so you're going into survival mode. So here's this, a new activation of the sympathetic nervous system by us driving. And so when you have a resource, what happens is that you start to slowly redirect, even if you're driving and you say, look, I'm driving, I'm stuck in traffic. There's nothing I can do. Let me bring in my resource. Let me start to shift my attention. Let me shift my attention towards my resource, towards my resource, towards my resource. Now, what are you doing? Your repeated state now becomes your resource. What would you rather be? Would you rather have an enduring trait of being in your resource and feeling safe or constantly feeling as if you're threatened and need to worry about your survival? It's your choice. I'm just asking you, which one would you rather have, right? So if we repeatedly practice coming to our resource, and this happens every single moment of every single day, what do you think your enduring trait is going to start to become? You are going to start to feel more safe. 
you are going to start to feel more present. You are going to start to take this zone of tolerance and starting to expand it. This doesn't happen overnight. It happens with time because you're actually rewiring your brain. You're rewiring the circuitry that you came in with that was programmed to be survival, survival, survival. Okay. There's another definition here of resource that I just want to read. Resource is the practice of inviting our mind and body to attune to sensations of safety or goodness, however small they may be. The process of attending to a felt sense of okayness begins the process of teaching our nervous system that it can experience stress and then come back to a state of calm. That's why, that's why resourcing is so important. Okay. Is that we're starting to get this sense of, Hey, I'm okay. Hey, this is okay. Even with all this threat, whatever that threat may be real or not real imaginary or not, it's okay. For this moment, I feel safe. Why? Because I'm choosing to place my attention towards something that I feel safe, that brings me this sense of safety. In the subsequent sessions, what we're going to do is we're going to tap into our resource and then slowly, slowly open up to any unpleasant sensations or thoughts that may be present that arise in the moment. First, we might look at unpleasant sensations in the body that arise and learn how to titrate, learn how to titrate those. So it's almost like an exercise, like we're starting to learn how to flex our resourcing muscle, flex it, go place your attention some other place, come back to your resource, place your attention some other place, come back to the resource, and really understanding and getting the felt sense of the ebb and flow of life, the natural unfoldment of energy the natural presence of expansion and contraction. So when or if that occurs to you, when you have a Kundalini rising, that you are resourced, that you can feel grounded, connected to the body, and that it doesn't just explode or go untethered. All right. So in this practice, I'm simply going to guide you to try out a few resources for yourself. Try to find the resource, a resource that is authentic for you. I don't know what that is. So I'm not going to guide you to one thing. We will come to the breath, but it's a completely different reason for coming to the breath later on and we'll go into a lot of the the science of breathing and things like that if you do use the breath great okay 